All right. Okay, so hello everyone. This is uh, class number four of our um, series, Family Dynamics in the Book of Genesis. This week we are going to be talking about Joseph and his brothers. Fascinating. Um, of course, it's huge. It really covers from Genesis chapter 37 all the way almost to the end of, um, of the book, but we're going to focus on um, the beginning with the, with the arguing and the jealousy between Joseph and his brothers, and then we're going to focus on the end with kind of the, kind of the reunion. Um, okay, so we are on in the, in the Tanakh, we are on page 226, beginning of Parsha Vayeshev, chapter 37. As you see, even though I always have a lot of sources, there's fewer sources tonight because we I think we're going to use just a lot of the of the plain text, um, which has you know, a lot to say, even without external commentaries. Um, okay, so um, if you remember Jacob, he has he has twelve sons. Where we find them now is they have left Lavan's house, which we talked about last week and um, been living in Lavan's house for so long. They've left Lavan's house. They are back um, in Canaan. And um, sadly, Rachel, Rachel, has died en route, giving birth to the 12th, uh, Jacob's 12th son, Benjamin. And that's where we are. OK, so as you see in uh, chapter 37, we start with Yosef in verse 2. He is 17 years old. Which is interesting because we don't really have a lot of um, telling of ages, especially when, especially when um, when they're young, when they are character, the characters in the Torah are young. So Joseph is seventeen years old, and it says he was um, tending the flocks with his brothers as a helper to the sons of his father's wife Zilpha and Zilpha. Now, no, interestingly, no, if you look in the Hebrew, the Hebrew is different. The Hebrew says Hayaroe et echav which literally would mean he shepherded his brothers. So just right in the English, they, they translate it, which makes more sense of what he was doing. He would he was a shepherd with his brothers. Um, but there is a commentary that says that he was very smart in terms of shepherding and he knew about all the all the tricks of the trade. Um, so he really was kind of like the manager or kind of like the expert over his brothers. But that's not, super, that's not really super important to, um, to say that he was or he wasn't. But we see that he is um, tending the flocks with his brothers, and he's a helper to the sons of his father's wives, Zilpah and Zilpah. And Joseph brought bad reports of them to their father. Now Israel loved Joseph best of all his sons, for he was the child of his old age, and he had made him an ornamented tunic. So without looking into any commentary, right, uh, if you're a parent, or even if you're not a parent, <laughs> you're like, this is not a great situation. Because what do we what do we know, right? So if I said, okay, what facts have we learned from these psukim? We had a favorite, right? He had a favorite. So that's already problematic, right? That um, here says Israel, but that is right. That is another name for Yaakov. But Yaakov loves Yosef most of all, and he shows it by making him this uh, ktonet pasim. Um, the but word, everyone else can see it too, right? It's not <laughs> right. It's not like he's keeping it inside, right? Yeah. And uh, interestingly, ketonet pasim, that expression, you only find it one other place in the Tanakh, which is in the story of um, Amnon and Tamar. Tamar was David's um, daughter, and she ends up getting raped. And in the beginning, just in, in part of the story, it says that she was wearing a ketonet pasim, meaning that it's some kind of royal garb. So you get the feeling, whether it was, you know, I know we were talking about it earlier, but I don't know if it was multicolored. It may just have been striped. It may just have been like pretty, um, but it was definitely nice. So where did it come from that they said it was a multicolored? Does it say anywhere here? It's you see you see here it translated as ornamented. ornamented. I don't really know That's if it ever said. is. I don't. I've never seen it translated as multicolored. I've really? seen it translated as striped. Um, Wonder where it came from. Okay. So um, okay, so that's one problem, and then we have another problem. Just be again before commentary in the verse before, and Joseph brought bad reports. So we don't know what the bad reports were, but it's tattling on his tattling, brothers. Right? He's telling <laughs> on his brothers for something. Um, so already that's like two. You know, we have favoritism by the father, 
is telling on his brothers, but both of these things are not going to endear him um, to his brothers. Okay, now we're gonna take a look at what some of it, like you you might say, I don't even need commentary because I already can see some problems in this, in this family, but um, we do have commentary. But even if before the commentary, if you just, I'm sorry, we should have read this, just this last verse, verse six, uh, four. And when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of his brothers, they hated him. So they could not speak a friendly word to him. So we see that, right, the Torah is outright telling us, even though I think, even if that pasuk was missing, we would have like said it in our commentary. Oh, and because of these things, they did not like him, but it's outright, they're, you know, they're jealous and they, and they hate him. They can't even speak to him, right? Um, which I think will be important a little later on because like, I think, you know, we, hopefully we don't have too many people like this, but sometimes there's people that you really dislike that just when you see them or they say anything, they could say the sky is blue and you already are annoyed and feel like it's irritating, right? So that's, it sounds to me how the Torah is describing um, their relationship. Now, if you take a look at our source sheet, we have a little bit of commentary that, you know, kind of um, adds to this. So number one, we have Rashi, who is um, picking up on the fact that it says he is a Na'ar. Who Na'ar already tells us that he is 17 years old, so it's kind of what is the, the word Na'ar adding? And Rashi says, his actions were childish. He dressed his hair, he touched up his eyes so that he should appear good looking. And we know that Yosef, we know in the story that he was a good looking person. We know that when he goes down to Egypt with the story with Potiphar's wife, um, and that he was kind of, it sounds here, kind of immature. He was into his looks. You see um, the next the next source, meaning that he were et b'nei bilha, right? The verse tells us that he was a helper. He would he would tend the flocks with his brothers, but he would also be a helper to the sons of his father's wife, Bilha and Zilpa. So there is always this kind of theme that the children of Bilha and Zilpa, the maidservants, are of a lower status than the children of Rachel and Leah. And even in the dynamic of the brothers, there was tension which is what Rashi is kind of picking up on. And maybe because Yosef also was on the outs with his brothers, even though he may have been on the outs with these brothers as well, but he would hang out with the sons of Bilhah and Zilpah because maybe they would accept him more because the children of Leah were really not accepted. You know, I just, just interrupt a moment. I look Nar, I, I grew up in Yiddish and Yiddish Nar means like, he's simple. He's, he's, I don't know if it's taken from this, but you, you, in Yiddish, there's a word as anar. Mean simple? Meaning he's, he's, he's foolish. fine, he's foolish, he's, he's not, he doesn't think. Okay. He just does, if, it, if you know, they tell you make it black, it's black, make it gray. He's, he's, he's simple. That's the only right. way I could. I could we think. definitely feel, and I, I, I didn't bring it in, it's definitely a controversial book, which I meant to, I, I always say, I'm going to read it this year. I bought mm -hmm. it many years ago. I read three pages, mm -hmm. but it is called. Um, was Yosef on the spectrum? An exception? Yeah, on the spectrum. Oh, yes. <laughs> and it's it's actually, it's not even, I would call like a very out of the box book, although the title is very, you know, you're like, what? But I started to read it, um, and hopefully I'll read it all over the weekend. <laughs> but um, <laughs> there, there is some suggestion, like these kind of behaviors, like not picking up on social cues, and, and maybe that, you simple. know, that, that there was something going on with Yosef. I'm sure many people find that title offensive and find the whole suggestion offensive. But I think it's fascinating, and one day we'll read the whole book. But we definitely see him here, right? He's, whether he's on the spectrum, not on the spectrum, he is, maybe he's just young, or maybe he wasn't the most, uh, you know, socially clued in person in general. Right? He's not picking up, it seems, and we'll see definitely in the next few to him. Um, but he's kind of, he is, he's kind of like immature, he's into himself, maybe a little arrogant, which why not if his father is, is um, favoring him like this. So he would then, but this is also kind of this immaturity of telling on his brothers. Rashi says, whatever he saw wrong in his brothers, he reported to his father. I didn't print the whole Rashi. He does go on to quote the Midrash that, you know, and then he lists bad things they were doing. They would be mean to the sons of Bilhan Zilpa. They would steal. You know, he gives a whole list. Um, I personally don't, not that I don't care. I just don't know where he gets all those things from. So I just feel like he was, he was a tattle. And whenever they did something wrong, then he would tell his father and then he would feel maybe that he endearing himself even more. Yeah. Um, I see the second two quotes for Rashi. 
come directly from Torah, but the first one, I don't see any mention of the makeup and whatever. Where, where does he get that idea? Oh, the makeup one? The first one. Where, yeah, it, and he gets it from the right. Midrash. Meaning- A Midrash outside the Talmud. Genesis Rabbah, the Midrash Rabbah. Yeah, I mean, it could well, be in the Talmud. Rabbah. It I could be in the that Talmud was too. Rashi saying it. Yeah, Rashi will often quote the Midrash, actually like 70 something percent of Rashi is quoting Midrash. <laughs> Sometimes he will change it a little bit, like from, if you look up the source. I'm sorry, I'm, 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 I'm good here. The, the Midrash you're talking about is in the Talmud and Rashi is quoting. It, it might some, be in the Talmud or it might not be in the Talmud. Okay. But yes, but it's an outside but somebody source. somebody else has said this. He didn't correct, make it correct. Correct. Yeah, it's, right. yeah, he did not okay. say that. He did not just like come up with this idea himself. He is quoting a Midrash that he had okay. already heard. He correct. already heard. Right. Okay, so that's where we are. Um, and then you see Swarno in number two. Um, he says he was he was an adolescent. Um, you know, if you have an adolescent in your house or you've ever had one, and I personally <laughs> teach adolescents, right? You know, they are you know they're kind of like sometimes very big kids, right? They and then they will grow up um, and they don't act really so mature sometimes. So he did not act as mature as he should have been or as his intellect made him appear to be. He was not experienced enough to realize what the ultimate effect of his bad mouthing his brothers would turn out to be. Um, and even though we see right that later he will at 30 become the mentor of the wisest men in Egypt, at the age of 17, he still had a lot to learn. I think that's just, you know, that's just how he was. Um, when we meet him later on, the end of this book when he meets his brothers again in Egypt he will be he will be a, a different person um I think okay now we have number three which I find very interesting and let's just like think back a little bit to what we know about Yaakov um and I've often wondered this Yaakov we know growing up and we talked about this that he had this experience where he knew that in his father's house you know you know he knows the stories of his family where one son was favored and one son was rejected and yet, we see that he openly favors um, one of his children, um, even though none of his children are rejected. And I think that was, in my opinion, I think that was Yaakov's intention. He saw, oh, the way it's been in my family is one son is accepted what, and the one son is like pushed aside. I'm not going to push any of my children aside. But yet, he favors Yosef. All right. And anyone, I mean, the Torah kind of hints to it, but why do you think he does that? Because he was Leah's son. Rachel's son. Rachel's son. He's Rachel's I mean, because right, he's Rachel's son. And I think I've always felt like he knows that he shouldn't, but he can't help himself because because she and I wonder if it'd be different if she hadn't died. But here, this is what he has left, kind of. Even though there's also Benjamin, but we assume that Benjamin was was pretty small in, at this time, and therefore he's still doing it. Um, he may also have more like a negative association with Benjamin because he like maybe likes a punch. Ah, yes, a excellent, bit. right? Because because he was like the cause, you know, or you know, not as well, right? Um, okay, and then this one just adds an interesting take, right? They would when it says they could not speak with him bishalom, meaning they would talk to him about whatever they needed to if it was business, right? If it had to do with the sheep, they would talk to him, but they would not talk to him about um, anything else, right? Nothing brotherly, nothing family like. Okay, so that's that's where we are. So we see this relationship going on, this dynamic in the family with Yosef and his brothers. Um, and then we have in the next Pesukim on page 227, verse five, Yosef has his dreams. Yosef had a dream which he told to his brothers and they hated him even more. He said to them, here's this dream which I have dreamed. There were binding sheaves in the field and suddenly my sheep stood up and remained upright and then your sheaves gathered around and bowed low to my sheep. So this is where we find, ah, uh, here is Yosef, like not really clued in, like you said, you know, read the room, like, do you think telling your brothers this dream is going to endear you to them? And of course it does not. His brothers answered, do you mean to reign over us? Do you mean to rule over us? And they hated him even more for all this talk about his dreams. Okay, so then, and here it's just, you know, it's amazing. He has another dream. <laughs> what does he do? He tells his brothers, like you think he would have learned from the first time not to maybe to keep it to himself because now he, he just, I think, you know, he, I think he hears, of course, this reaction that his brothers had to his first dream. 
And he's just really not clued in to, or he doesn't care, or maybe he did think I'm better than my brothers. I always get the feeling like he's just not really clued in. Like he wants them to like him, I think, but he keeps doing things that make them not like him. Um, so he has a second dream and he told his brother saying, look, I had another dream. And this time the sun, the moon and 11 stars were bowing down to me. When he told to his father and brothers, his father berated him. What he said to him, is this dream you have dreamed? Are we to come, I and your mother and your brothers and bow low to you to the ground? So his brothers, right, they're still mad at him. They're jealous of him, but his father kept the matter in mind, which I'm clear what that means. I think it means like, you know, there's this favoritism and Yaakov is thinking, like I'm publicly going to admonish you for this dream. We don't see that Yaakov heard the first dream. Plus it seems like the second dream you know, Yaakov is one of these, you know, sun, moon, and sun or the moon. Um, so Yaakov is going to berate him a little bit for the dream, but was it really? Like, of course, you, I'd love to hear how he said it, like with the tone, because the Torah tells us, oh, he was, it seems like he's kind of upset about it, but he's, he keeps it inside, like maybe it's really going to come true, and maybe he wants that kind of thing to come true. I wonder if the brothers kind of picked up on that also, like, was he very sincere in his, um, in his, you know, admonishing Yaakov. So there we have it. We have this dynamic, which is, is bad. And I would think that the stories, and we have all these reasons, and they're ongoing, you know, like he's telling on his brothers, he's an arrogant, immature kind of person. Um, he's telling the brothers his dream, not just once, second dream too. And then we have verse 12. His brothers, have gone to pasture their father's flock at Shechem. So we, this means that Yosef is not required to do the same hard work that the other boys are. Right. So interesting. It's one right. more thing. E either it's that, which is which could be true for sure. It also could be that they have left him behind, like because they don't want him <laughs> with him, right? And that is um, what what might be true also. Like they don't want him to be with them. Um, so they go off to Shechem. Israel says to Joseph, your brothers are pasturing at Shechem. Come, I will send you to them. Okay, so that, I, I, don't, I don't believe that um, Yaakov was not aware of this tension in his household. So I kind of wonder, and let me see what you think, why is he sending Yosef to the brothers? If he knows that the brothers do not like him. So Joseph and uh, yeah, Joseph's answer, I am ready. Yeah. He knows that there's some mission to this. Yes. But we don't know. He feels like it's a mission. And we'll talk about that in a second because you see this the in Hebrew, the Hineni is like a big um mm -hmm. a big loaded word in the Tanakh. But we'll get to that in a second. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I jumped ahead. That's okay. <laughs> Spoiler, that's okay. Yeah, that's okay. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> right. So I don't know. I kind of feel like basing it on my view that maybe even though Yaakov is part of the problem. He's also upset about the problem because he's the dad and he wants everyone to get along and he doesn't, even though he's doing the favoritism, he doesn't like the result of the favoritism. So I feel like maybe he's sending Yosef to kind of work it out, you know, or, or maybe he's like denying it that, that it's going on. Because when I first read it, I always wonder, why would you send them to Shechem? I mean, why would you send them to, to um, you know, why would you send Yosef to the brothers? And I think these things, right, they're hint at maybe he didn't have to go and he had some special treatment, or maybe clearly they have left him behind because it said in the beginning that he used to pastor and he used to do stuff with the, he used to um, shepherd the sheep with the brothers, but now he's not there with them. Um, the commentaries, if you look at your sheet on source four and five and six, um, pick up a lot on this place, Shechem. So Shechem is never a good place in the Torah. It's like has these negative overtones, right? Where are they shepherding? In Shechem. So if you see number four, the Rashbam reminds us that um, the wording reflects Yaakov's surprise. So I guess we should put like an exclamation point at the end of that pasuk. That Joseph's brothers chose to tend their sheep in a dangerous location such as Shechem, where they had killed the local inhabitants not so long ago. Okay, so we skip this part, but in chapter... I think 35 or 34, 34, on their way back, 
they stop in Shrem, meaning on their way back from Lavan's house, Yaakov and his whole family stops in Shrem. They're kind of like staying there for a certain amount of time. And then uh, Dina, who is the daughter of Yaakov and Leah, gets um, kidnapped, raped by Shrem, who the city is named after. It's like the king's son. And then there's this whole back and forth that they say, well, now I want to marry her. And at the end of the story, um, the brothers, led by Shimon and Levi, you know, trick the people of the town. They say, oh, okay, she'll marry him. It'll be great. We'll all be family. But you have to first have a circumcision of everyone in the town, everyone in the city. So they say, okay. And then when they're you know, weak and in pain from the, from the circumcision, they go and they kill everyone. And they rescue Dina. So that's what had happened in Shrem. So the Rashbam thinks that's weird for them to go to Shrem, which is a dangerous place, like to return to a place where you had done this terrible thing, and maybe like there's some you know, people still there who want to get back at you. That's one idea, which I and I also thought this was very nice. If you look in source four, it says, This is what I heard from Rav Yosef Caro, and I enjoyed his interpretation greatly. <laughs> I love that. Um, like he really just like I love, like when you read something and you're like, oh, what a great answer. Um, Rashi says that Shrem is a place for destined to be the scene of misfortunes, right? There the sons of Yaakov sinned by selling Yosef. There Dina was maltreated. There the kingdom of the house of David was divided, right? In the future also, when the kingdom of Judah will split into Judah and Israel and the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, it will also be there. So this is like, you know, when you read it, the Torah is kind of saying, Shrem, not a good place. Um, number six, what I thought was, uh, very interesting and a little bit of a different take. You see number six, Rav Tzvi Grumet. Shrem is a place where the brothers feel powerful. Like that's where they were powerful and where they reject their father's authority. Meaning in the story with Dina, they kind of did what they wanted. They didn't really tell Yaakov. And at the end of the story, he's upset about what they did. But that's where they're going now because they're upset at Yaakov again because he's feeding uh, Yosef and there's lots of tension. So they return to that place where they kind of have you know, do what they want and where they feel good about themselves. So I thought that was very interesting. Okay, in number seven, so you see that back in the text, when Yaakov says to Yosef, I'm going to send you to your brothers, or Yosef doesn't say, no, I'm a little nervous, you know they hate me. Um, he says he may me. Um, and I will tell you that this week, just a little bit of a, well, this past week, it was in this past part, Parsha of Akedas Yitzchak, um, and um, which led me in a little bit of a roundabout way. It was also the anniversary of the death of Rabbi Jonathan Sachs. And that led me to a video, which led me to a, the Leonard Cohen song, You Want a Darker, which if you have not heard, it's fabulous. I only knew one other song by Leonard Cohen, although he really talks, not doesn't sing. But anyway, it was a great song. And in that song, you can all Google it at home, um, there's a <laughs> He says, he may me over and over, um, I'm ready, my Lord. Um, so when you look, if you look at source number seven, you see that here are all the places where we have someone right, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the Torah text saying, here I am. So you see that in the English, it's not always the same. Like sometimes it's here I am, sometimes it's here, sometimes I am ready, um, here. But in the Hebrew, it's always the same. And I would, I would translate it more or less all the time, like either I'm ready or here I am, which is kind of like I'm ready to do what you want. And in all of the sources, it's like it is like what you said, like it's like a charge. It's like I know something important is happening and I'm ready to go. So I think Yosef picks up on that, like maybe Yaakov wants him to somehow reconcile with his brothers um, and he says, OK, like this is going to be hard, but I'm going to do it. He named me. We see it with in number one in Genesis 22 with, with the Akedah, with the binding of Isaac. Um, we have it when Yitzchak is about to give the bracha to Esav, and he says, and Esav answers, Hineni. We have it at the end of uh, Breshit when Yaakov is going to go down to Egypt, right, all at the end to meet Yosef, and he's afraid to go down to Egypt, and God says, when you should go, he says, okay, he calls out to me, he says, he me. So it's, it is significant, I think, that, they, that the Torah uses that expression um, for Yosef here. Although, interestingly, when I see Yosef about to go, I'm like, this is a bad idea. Yosef knows it. 
think Yaakov knows it too, but I kind of always feel like it's like they're not going to discuss that. He's going to say go, and he's going to say okay, and they're both thinking, oh, this could be terrible, but they both feel like it's important. So they're going to, so he's going to do it. Okay. Um, do you think that the that father, that Yaakov, really understands the implications? Because he has seemed pretty clueless about the effects of his showing favoritism. I think he knows that they don't love Yosef. I'm not sure if he's totally clued in on his part of it. Um, I think only maybe later on when Yosef is gone, you know, he will be able to, well, in all those years of missing him and reflecting on it, that he will be able to kind of think about it. You're right. I don't know if at this point in time, but I don't think he thinks that they love him. I just but think, I don't think he realizes his role in it. Yes, I agree. And necessarily that they dislike him so much. Right. I don't think so he realizes. Yeah, I think he's blinded by the switch for them to all get along. Yeah. I mean, I think that that's a good way to read it also. It also could be that he wants him to go, because even though he's favoring him, you know, he wants to include everybody. Like he wants, you know, he's not going to push aside any of his children, um, even though to some degree he's pushing aside 10 of his children, uh, you know, in that way, but not pushing aside like we've had before. Yeah, you're right. I don't think he's totally uh, clued in. Um, and also, yeah, go ahead. We already know that Joseph gets reports. Uh, you know, bad reports, and he apparently accepts them. Elizabeth, verse fourteen, he is basically saying, "Go do the same thing that you've always done." Yeah, that's also right. I'm not sure. I go and tell me and bring me back word. Well, right. I mean, Joseph knew exactly what he was doing. I'm, I'm not disagreeing right. with you. I'm just yeah. out a different. Mm -hmm. Right. So right. that would lead him more into that Yaakov was not clued in, or I mean, there is you know commentary suggesting that they really were not doing good things, and maybe he wants to really know, and that's. Way for him to know, um, but that really paints the brothers. Well, you find somebody else to do it besides your son. Correct. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah that's true. It's quite troubling. <laughs> yeah. All right. So he sends him, and then we have a few psukim. We're not going to spend time with it, although if we if we had more time, I would because I think it's very interesting. This little section, starting in verse uh, well, at the end of fourteen, to, you know, fifteen through eighteen, that he gets lost, Yosef, and he doesn't know where the right eyes. The brothers are not in Shem. And then, he, but someone finds him, a man, and he says, what are you looking for? And he says, I'm looking for my brothers. And he says, oh, they are in Do this place, Dotan. So he finds them in this other place, Dotan. I just found this a weird little, like, why do I have to know that he got lost? And that he, you know, I think it shows one that he was determined to find them because the dad had sent him because he could have just come back and said, I checked in Shlem and they're not there. Um, but I still think, you know, there, there is commentary that the man he found was the was the angel Gabriel, and he was you know, making sure that he got sent on this mission. Um, mm. There's another Midrash commentary that the place Dotan, um, you know, links just in the wording to Datan, Datan and Aviram, who we always know are like the bad guys in the Torah and in the Midrash, and they always are divisive. So it's like also like a foreshadowing, oh, you're going to go and there's going to be this, this divisiveness with your brothers. But I just find it's very, it's an interesting little part. And when I was preparing, I remember that once I must, I learned something very interesting and I could not find it. Um, but I think something's out there like more, more interesting than that. Although I think it's interesting that he says, um, what are you looking for? And he says, Anochi mevakesh. He is seeking his brothers, even though he's doing things that make them feel distant from him. I think it, Yosef is wanting, just like Yaakov wants everyone to be together, but he's causing them not to be together. So too Yosef also, he wants to be accepted by his brothers, but he's made it partially from his own fault that they don't accept him. Which is why I always feel like when we learn the story when we're younger, a lot of times we don't focus on that. But it's so clear in the Torah that it is, you know, it's not a blame just on Yosef at all. It's a blame on Yosef and on Yaakov and on the brothers too, I think. Um, okay, so he gets he gets to the brothers, they see him from afar. And you could just imagine it's like he's not even there. They see him coming, maybe because he's wearing, maybe it is multicolored, maybe mm -hmm. it's just unique, and you can see everything. They see him coming before he even gets there, they are. Here's plan A. Let's kill him. Yeah, <laughs> conspiring to kill him. And they said, here comes the dreamer. Come now, let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits. And we'll say, a savage bear devoured him. 
and then we'll see what comes of his dreams. So that's the first plan, right? We'll kill him and we'll pretend that um, somebody like it, you know, an animal ate him. But, and this is, this is when we start seeing something interesting in the family dynamic now between the brothers, excluding Jose. When Ruvain heard this, he tries to save him. So in Hebrew, it says, Veishma Ruvain, Veitzilehu mi Adam, Veyomer, lo nakenu nefesh. He says, no, let's, let, let's not kill anybody, right? Let's not kill anybody. And then you see in Pasa 22, it says again, you can see in the English too, and, and Ruvain went on. In the Chumash, when you, right, if someone is talking, um, you don't have to have another Vayomer, like another, and then he said, if he's still talking, unless there's been, that tells you that there's been like a pause. Um, and what you see here is that, and I think you'll see it with Ruben throughout the whole story, Ruben, even though he's the firstborn, is not really accepted as the leader of the brothers. And in this story, the leader of the brothers is going to be Judah. So when Ruben says, let's not kill him, no one really pays attention, right? You see no one reacting that he, sp that he speaks again. And he says, Vayomer, right? Then Ruben says again, and he speaks on, don't shed any blood, cast into that pit, out in the wilderness, but don't touch him yourselves. And then he has it, right? He, he has this motive to try to save Yosef, but he has to say it twice, and he has to, like, give them another reason. Like, not just don't kill. Okay, kill him, but only indirectly, right? You'll throw him in the pit, he'll die eventually, and then you don't have to feel like you you know, killed anybody because you didn't direct, you didn't really actively do it. And you see, they don't respond to him, but they, they do that. When Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his tunic, they took him, they cast him into the pit. So they are following Ruben, but they are not really giving him any like recognition. Um, and they're just, you know, the plan is still, let's kill him. Now Ruben says, right, we all know the story, Ruben is going to hopefully come back a little bit later and take Yosef out of the pit. Okay, now you have this very weird part. Yeah. Right? So they sit down to eat. Yeah. <laughs> Looking up, of course. which already it seems very interesting. If you saw the show, they right? Do <laughs> right? They sit do down to have a meal. Um, Looking up, they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilad, their camels bearing okay, all these things. Then Judah says to his brothers, What are we going to gain by killing our brother and covering up his blood? Right? We're not gaining, like, let's make money from it. Like, let's sell him to the Ishmaelites and let's not do away with him ourselves. After all, he's our brother. And then you see, it says, his brothers agree. In Hebrew, that says, uh, echad. So, right, as a pair, as opposed to Ruvain, who no one is really paying attention to, or else just a little bit, here's Judah, and it's telling us, okay, plus he's made them like, it is a, a better idea. I think we're going to make money. They sold Joseph for 20 pieces of silver to the Ishmaelites who brought Joseph to Egypt. Okay, oh, sorry. Well, midnight traders passed by. Okay, so what's weird about this? We're going to spend a little bit of time because you've spent a long time talking about this, but what's the problem here? Midnight's and Ishmaelites. Like, who's, who bought Rabbi Yosef? Do you ever read in Hollywood? has a big chapter on this. Like, who did it? There's Ishmaelites, there's Midianites, there's the brothers, right? I've always, when I was younger, and if you watch, you know, the Broadway show or the cartoon movie, right? It, the brothers make money. There is a way to understand it, which I think makes a lot of sense, um, where the brothers do not make any money. <laughs> um, okay, and this is how you could understand it. First of all, it, it explains this part. They sit down to a meal. So either, like I've always thought, they just sat down right there, and there's Yosef screaming, save me, oh, <laughs> right? like crying, and, and they're just eating and ignoring him, so it makes them really cruel and insensitive. So there is an idea, which I think is not far-fetched, that they did not sit right there, that they moved away a little bit, um, so as not to hear him crying and screaming, and that's where they're eating. Then, so they're not near the pit, but they're like, you know, they're a little bit far away, and then from far they see the caravan of Ishmaelites coming. And that's when Judah has this idea, let's sell him to those Ishmaelites. So now they have to get up, and they're going to go and try to meet the Ishmaelites, right, and sell Yosef. But in between, these Midianite traders pass by, meaning pass by the pit where Yosef is. They hear him crying. They pull him up. And then they sell Joseph, meaning when it says they, it means they sell, the Midianites sell him to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver, which makes a little sense because then what happens is when Reuben comes back to the pit, he says, oh my gosh, he's not here. So. Firstly, you're wondering, but if he's with the brothers, 
like eating, aren't they all together? Maybe he's not with them. And then he goes to his brothers and he says, the boy's gone, now what am I gonna do? Now you see again, the brothers do not answer him. <laughs> I do think the, the, that theory has a little flaw because I would like a pasuk where the brothers acknowledge that he's, he's missing and they kind of miss their chance. Like they also go back to the pit and he's not there. Um, and maybe they're surprised and they don't really know what happened to him. They assume, I think, that he got to Egypt, but they don't really know because they didn't do it and therefore they don't get any money in the end from his sale. But they're still left with what do we, like they know that he's gone. Um, and I think it's interesting because you see Reuben is like, what am I going to do? Um, maybe because he's the oldest and he feels like the blame will go to him, even though the brothers don't view him as such a leader. He's still the, the oldest of the family, but the brothers don't even respond to him. And they don't say anything, so I don't know. But they don't respond to him because I think they just, they don't really give him a lot of uh, credence. Okay, so they take Yosef's tunic, they, they slaughter, the, you know, and then they bring him, they show it to Yaakov. Now we're gonna see this reaction, which I find fascinating. And I think it's, uh, we're gonna be on now uh, 32, on page 232. So they have the ketone pasim, like the coat, and they say to the father, we found this coat. Is it your son's or not? And he recognizes it and he says, my son's tunic, a savage beast devoured him. Joseph was torn by a beast. And what is Yaakov's reaction? Total mourning, right? He rips his clothes, he puts on sackcloth. We see this um, always, these are signs of mourning. But you see in verse uh, 34, right? signs of mourning, Vayitabel al beno yamim rabim. Many days now he is, he is mourning, crying. All his sons and daughters try to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted, saying, I will go down mourning to my son in Shaul. So what do we learn from this? He can't be comforted. He's so upset. And I think, I've often wondered, like, why did the brothers, why didn't they just say to the father, who knows what happened to him? He never showed up. I don't know, you said you sent him? We didn't, we didn't see him. Like, they want y Yaakov to see that he's dead. That's why they want to dip the coat in the blood. And why do they want that? I think they feel like if they don't get rid of yeah, if they don't get rid of Yosef, they will never write, and here's back to the dynamic, they have no attention, right, that they want from their, from their father. If we get rid of Yosef, I think the brothers thought, okay, he'll be sad, rightly so, we'll take some time, then he'll say, oh, look, I have these 10, you know, plus the young, I have these 10 other sons, and then he'll give them attention. But what does the Torah tell us? He cannot be comforted. So at the end of the day, the brothers have not really succeeded in their plan, which I think all along was like what, you know, when he comes near them in, uh, in Dotan, they want to get rid of him. And that's their plan. Well, it's to kill him, to sell him. They want him out of their family picture. And when they do that, I think he becomes kind of even like larger and maybe to some degree, like he's there now all the time as the son that died or the son that's missing or whatever. I think, I mean, some people say that Yaakov never felt like he was dead, and, but I think he thinks he's dead. Um, but he can't, he can't move he's on. He's a martyr. Kind of. Mm -hmm. Also, maybe there's guilt because Yaakov yeah, sent yeah. him, you know, I sent him there and he was so willing and, you know, and also I think, you know, after people pass away, we always remember them, hopefully, fondly. So whatever the bad traits were have like faded out. Um, and that's, and that's where we, and that's, uh, and that's where we find, um, that's where we end here. Okay, now. What I want to do now is we're going to fast forward to chapter 42. Now we're going to just take a look at the, like this, because uh, it's such a long, long story, at Yosef when he becomes, uh, when he's already now, there's the famine, and he's the second in command. Um, okay, so we are on, well, first I just want to look quickly, chapter 41, uh, verse 50. You see, or 51, you see, right, Yosef is now high in command in the Triumph. He marries um, Potiphar's daughter, um, page 256, and he has two children. The first one he names Menashe. God has made me forget completely my hardship and my parental home. And the second one he names Ephraim. God has made me fertile in the land of my affliction. So I've always felt 
you know, especially when people have these explanation of the names and we see that in the Torah, what is Yosef saying? I moved on, right? It was painful, my brothers, my father, but the name, the naming of his children, one is God is helping me forget. And the second one is that I'm super, and I'm, and I'm successful here. Um, and I think he's trying to move on. There's a, there's a fascinating article by um, Rabbi Israel Rav Yol Bin Nun. It's called, it always reminds me of E.T. because it's called like, why didn't Joseph phone home? <laughs> um, and in very quick, it's a, you know, it's a, like he's gone so far and he's super powerful. Why is he not seeing what's happened back in Canaan with his family? So he suggests that maybe Yosef, because his father had sent him to that place, Dotan, to check on the brothers, even though we think the father knows that at least there's tension, that maybe the, he suspects, even though the father was favoring him, um, maybe because there's a history of one son gets pushed aside or some sons get favored and some sons like don't, that maybe you know once he gets there and everything happens to him with his brothers, he feels like maybe my father was also in on it. I don't know. Right? Or no one's come to check on to see where I am. Don't they know that I'm here somewhere in the Um, the father's not, you know, he's a know that they said he was dead. So there's this like, you know, that maybe that's why um he never tries at all to to reach out to his family. Or maybe he's just upset. And like this, I think just from the shot is that he's just trying to put it behind him. But I always thought it was odd that like not after maybe 10 years, you know, he's successful, right. he has a big shot, he's got family and everything. He's in a, he's the one in a position of power. Right. And he, has that he didn't get word back just to say, ha, huh, you thought you killed me. <laughs> I am not only alive and doing well, but I'm second in command in Egypt. Or not so braggy just to say to his father, you know, it's been a long time, but just want to let you know I'm okay. Right. I also right. He could have done one or the other yeah. way, even anonymously for himself. I could have done that, or he could have just, just for his own knowledge. Just right. I do think that's odd too. Um, okay. Well, I mean, I don't think it does say that he never like sent someone to find out. It doesn't say he didn't, but then that he did. So yeah. I've never seen anybody say that he that he did because you see that when his brothers when the brothers come, down, come there's all these questions yeah. like, is my father alive? Like, what's going on? Yeah, that's true. Um, yeah, but it wouldn't write. If it doesn't say that, we can always go like, you know, Tori doesn't tell us. And then, mm -hmm. yes, um, yeah, but here I think we have kind of that proof. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the brothers go down to Egypt. Now we're in uh, page 258, chapter 42. The brothers go down to Egypt. Yaakov will not send Benjamin, which we understand, right? Now Benjamin also a little bit older, um, but he sends the other 10 brothers and they come to Yosef. Uh, verse, uh, verse 7, page 259, and Rosef sees his brothers. He recognizes them, but he acted like a stranger toward them, and he speaks very harshly to them. So you can imagine, of course, they don't recognize him because also he was younger and he changes, and he looks totally different, and I don't think they're not expecting him to be this. Maybe they're expecting, and maybe they were thinking, um, maybe we'll see him as a slave somewhere, and maybe they were anxious about it, but they do not they don't expect that. So, so, so how much time is so from the time he was in the pit? And right. I think we think like 20 pit. years. I guess that's a long time. Yeah. Especially well, when you're seven. Well, he was 17 right. and they said he became a big shot at 30 already. Right. And then it's after because it's right because it's the years yeah, of the seven years of right. So, right. so he could look totally think about when you're 17 and then you're like 40. I don't know. You're totally different. And dressed as right. a and dressed and in this position. And they're not expecting it. Okay, so he sees them, and then you see, right? He's very unnerved because you could see that he, he his reaction, as you see, is he speaks harshly. He says, "Where do you come from?" They come, they come from Khan. Um, he's recalling the dreams, right? You see, there's a lot of trigger. I would think just seeing his brothers, and he accuses them of being spies. And they said, "No, we're not spies. We're all brothers from the same man, and we're honest." And then he says, no, you've come to see the land in its nakedness. That's his verse 12. They said, no, we're servants, 12 brothers, son of a certain man. And the now one is no more. So that's also interesting. Like, why are they sharing why that? Why did he maybe, mention that? Maybe to have some kind of pity, you know, like maybe to make it more personal so that he would stop accusing them. Uh, maybe, and I think this might, I think we'll see this going on, maybe because this is something that is weighing on them. And it, like, since it's it happened. Still, it's still at home. Joseph is still right. 
present in everybody's right, life. Right, especially if we know that Yaakov is still never getting over it, right? It's not like, you know, so no one has really moved Everybody on. And I'm sure there's a lot of guilt from the brothers, yet, you know, put yourself in their place. Are they going to admit it now? Like, you know, and then as time goes on, it's like worse and worse. We're going to say, oh, by the way, Dad, like, you know, 15 years ago, <laughs> now we're going to, like, you know, I feel like they're stuck. They, they can't admit it anymore, or even if they could, and if they admit it, the dad will hate them um so they're just stuck with they're stuck with it so he says no you're spies right, says, you're spies um unless your youngest brother comes here you're never all gonna leave you see at first which i think that you don't, we don't know unless we do this part i actually i mean for many years i didn't know this part existed he says you see in verse 17 he can find them in the guardhouse for three days right so he puts them all in jail for three days and i think that's because yosef needs to also like think it through now you see on the third day, Yosef, his language is much kinder. Do this and you shall live, for I am a God-fearing man. If you are honest men, let one of your brothers be held in your place of detention while the rest of you go and take home rations for your starving households, but you must bring me your youngest brother. So like this is already nicer, right? In the beginning, oh, we skip this up, but in 16, he says, one of you will go and bring your brother and the rest of you are going to be in jail. And then he flips it. Right, only one of you has uh, has to be in jail, like ransom. Right, I'm going to hold you, and everyone else can go home, and I'm going to give you food. And they did that. Now, while they're talking amongst themselves, they say, "Alas, this is verse 21. We are being punished on account of our brother, because we looked on his anguish and we paid no heed as he pleaded with us." So you see, it's clearly on their minds. Then again, we have this issue with Reuben, which will happen here and one more time. Reuben will speak up. He says, didn't I tell you, do no wrong to the boy, but you do not pay attention to me. Now comes the reckoning for his blood. And you see, no response from the brothers. First of all, that's an unhelpful thing to say, I think at this time, <laughs> I would think. But they don't, you know, they don't, they just don't care what he says. They don't view him as a leader. So, okay. Um, but they didn't know that Yosef was listening. So, Yosef hears them and he hears, ah, they're sad. They remember me and they, they're sad about what they did. He turns away from them and he cries. He takes Shimon, he binds him, right? You know, he ties him up and then he says, okay, here's your grain. Go back and bring your brother, you know, bring your younger brother back. So what we're going to see now for the rest is that Yosef is trying to kind of test his brothers to see, are they still the same people? What I've seen so far is it seems like they're, um, they're upset. I mean, they're upset about what they did. But what I'm going to do is now I'm going to hold one. It's kind of a little bit reenacting. I'm going to, oh, well, he wants to see Benjamin, clearly, but he's going to take one brother and see if they will leave that brother behind or will they come back for him, which a little bit is like what happened to him, right? Will they just let him go and be kind of like selfish now that they have food or will they, will they, you know, do what he says? Um, now it's interesting. Okay. So what happens next is he secretly though puts their money back in their bags. You see in verse 28, they're at like the hotel for the night, their encampment, and then they say, my money has been returned. And they all look and they all see that their money is back in their bags. So I'm not sure why he does that. I think to unnerve them a little bit, like here's this ruler, he was super mean to us, then he was a little bit nicer to us, now he put our money back in our bags. Um, there are some, the commentators say maybe it's like hinting to the whole sale with money and he was trying to like give them hints the whole time, which they seem to not pick up on at all that he's Yosef, but I don't think that was a good hint, personally. <laughs> but I think it's really unnerving them. Like, wait, now maybe we'll be in trouble. We'll go back and they'll say we didn't pay. And you know, there's no like defense. Like if he says I didn't pay, then maybe then we'll go to jail. So there's definitely some unnervingness about, about that part. Okay, then they go back. Um, we're skipping a little bit just for time. And um, they say to Yosef in verse 36, oh, they tell Yosef, sorry, a little bit before, they tell Yosef what happened and that they have to bring their youngest brother. And that's what the guy said. They tell him everything that happened. This is what the leader said. And their father Jacob said to them, it is always me that you believe. Joseph is no more. And now Shimon is no more. And now you would take away Benjamin. These things always happen to me. Right, so he's saying, no way, right? I'm not letting you take Benjamin. You already came back one last brother, and you can't take Benjamin. And then Reuben, here's the last, here we see Reuben again. He says to his father, trying to you know, stand up and be the leader, he says, 
you can kill my two sons if I do not bring him back to you. If I don't bring Benjamin back, you can kill my sons. Put him in my care and I'll return him to you. Okay, what do you think of that idea? <laughs> it's like bizarre, a little bit, right? Like he's, he, you see what he's trying to do. He's trying to say, I'm taking charge, trust me, I'm gonna do everything I can, right? I'm not gonna let him keep Benjamin. But he says this bizarre thing of like, you can kill, so, you know, instead of having now you have less Joseph, Shimon, now you'll have two less grandchildren because I'll kill my own children. Like, it's a very bizarre thing. And as you see, um, no one really pays attention to it. And, and what is the response? Yaakov says, no way. My son must not go down with you for his brother is dead and he alone is left. He meets with disaster on the journey you are taking. You will send my white head down to Sheol and grief. Like that same kind of, you know, reminiscent from Yosef. Like, I'm going to just, I can't take, you can't send him. So it's interesting. Then if you look at the next verse, right, they don't, they don't bring it up again. They don't go back to Egypt until they run out of food again, right. which is fascinating to me. Like, is Yaakov willing? Like, what about Shimon? He's just there. And so it takes a long time. Then they run out of food again, right? Which, you know, is a serious thing. And Yaakov says, okay, go get some food. Now we have Yehuda. Yehuda reminds him again, but the man says, we can't go get food unless, unless you bring your brother. And then um, in verse six, Yaakov says, why did you tell him you had a brother? <laughs> What's wrong with that? That was stupid. And he said, but he kept asking us and asking us, is your father still living? Do you have a brother? And then Yehuda convinces him that he can, that they'll take, um, that they can take Binyamin back. So we see that here we have between Reuben and Yehuda. Again, we have um, Yehuda being the leader. So they take all the gifts. Now, here we go, here we go. Uh, page 265. They go all the way down and they present themselves to Yosef. This is verse 15. Now, Yosef sees Benjamin. Now, now you see, so you're Yosef. You say, well, look, they did it. They didn't leave Shimon behind, but you're not really sure. Like, how are the brothers really changed? Because one, it took them a really long time to come back. Maybe they really only came back, which a little bit is true because they had no food. Two, they came back for Shimon. And remember, Shimon is the son of Leah. You know, maybe, you know, Yosef's wondering, would they come back for a son of Rachel? Or do they have this hatred still, or, you know, like they did for me, and he's probably also the favorite. So, even though he's kind of tested them already, but he has to do this last test, which is going to be about Benjamin. And he remembers that he gets them, you know, he finds out info when he like makes them like feel uncomfortable. So in the beginning, he put them all in jail, and then he overheard them talking about what the day that they had done to him. So now he makes them uncomfortable, but this time it's in the opposite. He gives them like very special treatment. So if you look inside, um, he says, take the men into the house, slaughter, prepare an animal, and they're going to dine with me. Like super wow, they're gonna have a big meal with the with you know the second in command. They do. You see in verse 18, the men are frightened. It must be they're all nervous because of the money, right? Ah, oh, he now he's gonna take us inside, but then he's gonna upset, he's gonna be upset because he's gonna say we didn't pay. But when they go, right, they kind of they as you see, they're going into us, they say, Listen, verse 20, we came down once before, and when we arrived, we had our money, and they're like, Don't worry about it, all's good. Okay, so it's also, you know, there's they're still feeling unsettled. Um, and then uh, hold on one more part. Okay, then he asks, he greets them in verse 27, page 266. He asks them, How's your father? They say he's all good. And then, oh, is this your brother Benjamin? Right? Verse 30, he's very overcome with emotion, of course, because he sees Benjamin. He washes his face and he says, serve the meal. Now, what you see is interesting. One is there's three tables. They serve Yosef by himself. This is verse 32. And them by themselves. And the Egyptians eat by themselves because the Egyptians don't dine with Hebrews because that's abhorrent to the Egyptians. But the brothers also are noticing, oh, look, Yosef, he doesn't, he's an Egyptian, isn't he? Or maybe he's not because he doesn't eat with the Egyptians. Even then. Right. Or maybe because he's fans, like they don't know. And then what's really weird, as they were seated by his direction, he seats them from the oldest to the youngest. Right, and they look at themselves in astonishment in verse 33. And Benjamin gets double portion. Right, so even though on the surface this is lovely, look, he's treating us so nicely. Like there's weird things going on. How does he know how to see us? How does he know how to? Oh, look, just weirdly coincidental. Um, and it's very weird. 
Then we have this last part. Okay, the last part is that he accuses Benjamin and right, Benjamin, he puts it, he puts it in his bag. This is on chapter 44, which we'll just take a while inside of time. Right, because he and he does it in a very you know organized way. So you know, like they 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 search from the oldest to the youngest, everyone opens their bag, right? And he says, I have to, you know, Benjamin, he stole it. And now I'm going to take him because, you know, he's guilty. And that's like the ultimate test for Yosef with his brothers. Will they leave him behind or will they not? Um, which is what they had done to him. And if you look just at the last verse here in source number nine, so it's interesting because you see they do not leave him behind, right? And we're out of time, but, you know, Yehuda will then give a big impassioned speech, take me instead. Um, and then there will be this kind of lovely reunion. But if you look at this Midrash Rabbah, and I always often wondered, um, it's a little bit of a different take on it. So number nine, the Midrash says, when the goblet was found, meaning in Benjamin's sack, the brother said to him, what, you're a thief, the son of a thief, which he's saying, Previously, Rachel, on her way out from her father's house, she had stolen his idols. And she sits on them and she says, oh, I can't get up because I have a period and I can't, I don't feel good. Um, so they said, ah, meaning, what is this Midrash? And telling us that they, sus they didn't, they did suspect, even though the whole situation is weird, they suspect that maybe Benjamin really did steal the cup. And then Benjamin replies then, is my master Jophus, Joseph, whom you sold into slavery here, is the goat here. Brothers who sold their brother into slavery should talk to me this way. Astounding. So according to the Midrash, she replies to them, who's calling who, right? The, like, what's the reception? You call the cattle black? Like, you're telling me that, I, that I, because my mother did something that I did it? Look at you. Look what you've done. And I don't think, like, you have no right to speak to me. But what's interesting about this Midrash, even though I, I think it's a little far from the Torah reading of it, is that um, they did suspect him a little bit, and yet, that's I think the point, to me, that's the point of this midrash, and yet they still really defend him, because they know this is Benjamin, and we, ha we have to, you know, stand up for him, and we have to bring him back. Um, so, in conclusion, since, you know, of course, there's met, it's much more to this story, but I think we covered a lot in one hour, uh, we see that, you know, in all this four weeks, that you know, families are families, and they all have their issues. Um, and I always think that the Torah tells us these stories to learn from them, you know, for the better, to say, you know what, it, this happens. You know, and I'm sure if we, like, you know, close the recording and everyone, we shared all of our family dysfunction together. Like, everyone <laughs> has their own family stuff. And, you know, you do your best, and there's good and there's bad. Um, but we should not think that in the times of the Torah, like, they did not have issues within their families as well. And I think that is the point, you know, for us to learn from them. I mean, I think this does have a happy ending, although even after Jacob's death, the brothers are still suspect of like, is he mad at us? And, um, you know, I mean, I think we come to terms somewhat, but I think we'll see, you know, there's devices moving along the tribes as we move forward because when there's family, you know, there is often tension. So, yeah. So thank you all for coming. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry. Oh, I just thought it was interesting that you brought up the, um, example of Rachel stealing the idols, but you could think of maybe a more like pertinent sort of example, though not exactly, um, which they might remember more, which is when Rachel comes to Leah and is like, give me your mandrakes, and then Leah basically accuses her of stealing. Ah, stealing her husband. So yeah. that's something that they probably would remember more, and it like sort of capitalizes on the tension between like Rachel and Leah's children. Right. I mean, we don't really see anything about what the relationship was between Benjamin and the brothers. But it could be that they, I always think that maybe they have so much guilt about Yosef. So the favoritism that Yaakov probably yeah. showered on yeah. Benjamin, which is not really recorded at all, they understand it. Um, and it doesn't, you know, it doesn't seem to bother them. You know, I always thought in my 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, that somehow or another, as I got older, the family would resolve conflicts <laughs> or, or things would change. Yeah. And it just gets more complicated. I think it does get complicated. I remember when I was little. And, and, but that doesn't happen here. This, the second half of the story, better. after he goes to Egypt yeah, and grows up, that's true. All the dynamics between the brothers and Joseph, it all gets really complicated. Yeah. Now. I remember when I was little, and my mother once said to me, Oh, this person, he doesn't talk to his brother. And I'm like, What? He doesn't talk. You cannot talk to your brother. Like, you know, I mean, as I get older, I know people, you know, like things happen. 
And when you're little and you don't talk to your brother, <laughs> like it's only when you're an adult where sometimes people have these rifts that can just be so, you know, I mean, sometimes they, they resolve them, but sometimes they really don't. Um, then you get yeah, grandchildren, it's it really complicated. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's very sad when you have people in the same family who are talking about it. I don't know.